if you think about it, if every time we sat down to do a practice and practice what the Mahayana Buddhists call those three supreme points of practice. So for instance, if we started every time that you sat down to do a practice, and considering if you did a practice daily, that you took a moment to reconfigure, recalibrate your disposition, remembering probably, perhaps, already having coming, come to the conclusion in the past that to dedicate what you're doing for the benefit of others to be um, profoundly useful, profoundly beneficial, not only for ourselves, but eventually also for others. So every time if you sat down to do a practice, you just took a moment, and not to do it just because we're supposed to do it, but to do it because it genuinely feels good. That's a starting point. And it, it has a very beautiful energy with it. So if I took a moment to really, you know, I don't know for you what it is that on any given day would get you there into that genuine space, perhaps effortless sometimes, and then perhaps other times it takes really kind of contemplating something. Some days perhaps it's meditating on the fact of our eventual death. Uh, that's very powerful and can pull me right into the present moment uh, with, with some genuine contemplation. But also then sometimes perhaps we think about suffering and we just take a moment to think of the suffering that if, if we ourselves are experiencing suffering, that's useful. But if we're not current, if we're feeling quite all right, then, f then contemplating and remembering the suffering of others and then dedicating our practice to the wish for others to be free of suffering. And what, I recommending, what I'm recommending is Ad Gure Name, Jugad Gure Name, Sat Gure Name, Siri Gurudeve Name the four boundless dispositions, the four boundless attitudes, or sometimes called the four immeasurables. Ad gure name is that wish for others to be happy. That's called boundless love. That's called boundless happiness, the wish for others to find happiness. And then jugad gure name is that wish, it's meditating on boundless love, the wish that both ourselves, it's not excluding ourselves, in fact, it very much needs to to include ourselves and as a starting point, has to be directed also to ourselves, but not only to ourselves. The, the wish that other ourselves and others be free of suffering as well as the cause of suffering. May they have happiness, may I have happiness, may you have happiness, and also the cause of happiness. And then, Satagude Name, Satagude Name, meditating on joy. When I feel happy, when other feel, I, I find happiness in others' happiness, is called joy. And then, Siri Guru Deva Name, the most expansive, is impartiality. It's that those wishes are not bound to my biases and, and some relationships but not other relationships. But as far as beings go, may my wishes go never, only end there. And so, as long as beings remain, as long as space abides, may I too abide uh, to dispel the misery of the world. And so if on the regular, on the daily, one at least endeavored to genuinely bring ourselves into that space, slowly but surely, we would definitely start to strengthen that muscle. 
it's called training the psyche. It's creating pa better pathways for happiness and bliss. Because without training, the mind will continue to do what it's currently doing. And unless I'm fully liberated, which I'm not, then there's certain things my mind is currently doing that are not advantageous for me or others. And so therefore, if I am constantly bringing myself into that position, and I'm already practicing, I'm already working on my prana, I'm already working on my vitality, I'm already working on the mind and my meditative mind and, and all of those important things. But now if I blend in with it, that these immeasurables, these boundless attitudes, then it's going to mix in such a way where we won't be doing what folks are called nowadays spiritual bypassing because it's not turning away from other people's suffering it's actually turning towards other people's suffering it's easy enough if especially if we're privileged and if we find ourselves on this then in this you're taking this class right now that's a certain level of privilege I have a certain level of privilege. You have a certain level of privilege. That's not a bad thing, but it's good to recognize it because with privilege also comes certain responsibility, I believe. And so it's easy if I have a, especially a good amount of, of, I'm very privileged. I'm privileged to live in Nevada City. I'm privileged to have a home. I'm privileged to have a family. I'm privileged to be working right now. I'm privileged to have the company of all of you. I'm privileged to have this beautiful like technology systems that allows us to be together. You know, it's fortunate. I'm blessed. I'm very, very blessed. And I recognize that. And so it's, it would be very easy for any of us to be in our blissful place, our, but, at, but not paying attention to the tremendous suffering that others are experiencing and let's be let's be real that also we are experiencing because that's not real bliss being able to kind of meditate my problems away but if i had to for instance go into the real uh the real if I had to really, you know, come face to face with my suffering, where would I be? How efficiently and how well am I, am I prepared uh, to leave this body? That always becomes the question. How, if I, if I was on death's doorstep today, What would that be like? How, how comfortable or uncomfortable would I feel? Uh, and we're all there. At some relative level, each, every single one of us are already on death's doorstep. It's always right off to the side. It's always right behind. It's always right around us. But it's not dark and uh, dreary, but rather it's an ally. It's a medicine. And when, it, when the thought of death provokes uh, uh, fear or nervousness and uncertainty, that's not innately negative. That doesn't necessarily need to cause me or anyone else suffering. But I do have to feel it. And I do have to wrestle with the reality that that is going to be the case for me at some uncertain time. And, you know, inshallah, it's, it's years and years and many, many decades down the road. But I don't know if that's the case. It could be tomorrow. And so my relationship to that is also my relationship to life itself. And... To take a moment to bring ourselves into, in, to use the, the tool of meditating on one's mortality, to bring oneself into the present moment, 
allows us to connect to what's actually genuinely important for us. It will not cause us more depression. It will not cause us more sorrow and unhappiness. But in fact, quite the opposite. If we do it genuinely and we do it consistently, you know, there's this idea that somehow like happiness is just going to come right away. But when we're talking about sukha, the really that deeper sustained happiness that doesn't rely on external stimulus to maintain it, but a but a deep state of of santok of inner contentment, that even if things are very difficult, that sukha doesn't doesn't uh, become distorted or dissipate. This takes years, in generally speaking, to cultivate, if not decades. And so, if I believe that uh, I'm that when this life ends, that that's like that's it kaput, then I may not spend that time really developing what I what what is going to give me true sukha, it's true happiness, because it's going to take a while, and. And then it may feel, before you kind of step on that path, it may feel daunting and it may feel like um, uh, heavy or dark or, or a ton of work. But my experience of it is once you really step on the path, the joy only increases and the cheerfulness of life only increases. Especially, especially if the meditations we're doing in the wisdom that we're generating in the magnetism that that we're generating is mixed with the consistent cultivation of a compassionate heart turning towards suffering not away from it standing up for something it's not about about not having conviction in what you believe in but rather it will give you more conviction in what you believe in because you become a friend of a dharma. And when you become a friend of a dharma, that means you're a vehicle for a dharma. And that means you're a vehicle for truth and love and reality. And a servant of that. Not a perfect vehicle. One day a perfect vehicle. But right now an imperfect vehicle we are. So we recognize that. I watched AOC uh, speaking to uh, Congress today. I recommend people watch that. And... It's, it's sad um, and heartbreaking and also inspiring and beautiful. I'm so happy we have these powerful women stepping into leadership roles. It's uh, long awaited. I won't say long overdue, and from a certain context it is, but also from another context, the timing is perfect. And we need these sisters. We need them to, to speak out. We need them to speak against patriarchy. And then we need other, other men, male identifying beings, to, to speak also in the same way. And this is a major time on the planet. And it's a beautiful time to be alive. And to turn away and to be like, it's all good. It is all good from a certain con context, from an absolute ultimate context, definitely. Yet at the same time, I believe the moment calls for our attention. And it calls for our hearts. And it call calls for our convictions. And it call calls for us to stand up for what we believe in. And... I think this is very, very important. And uh, so, as yogis, it's easy uh, to feel great. You see? So the risk becomes there that we do have a tendency to bypass other people's suffering. And the big lesson we're learning as a species, I think, this year, is how inappropriate that is to bypass other people's suffering. And it's inappropriate only because it's, we, 
we take part in it. We all benefit from each other. And so to take the Dharma warrior disposition, to have the audacity to endeavor to cultivate the type of love that even extends to your enemies, your so-called enemies, is a, is a phenomenally beautiful thing to give, give effort towards. doesn't mean we're going to be perfect in it at all, but we'll make progress in it, and the more progress we make, the more happy you and I become. So it's a win-win, definitely. And it's a path of joy, and it's a path of happiness. It's not a path of, of sternness and, and heaviness and seriousness. There, there is some heavy you know, there is some moments for penetrative seriousness and, and to draw your sword of wisdom. But love is the guiding flame. And, and so we know how to do that. But we live with lightness. We live, we live with, with sensitivity and gentleness and humor and happiness and a sense of affection towards other human beings, no matter who they are. And so when we move the prana and work with the life force and work with the chakras, we're able to experience that more easily because the ego loses its tight grip on the mind. As the life force circulates up, it purifies ahamkara, the sense of self, the ego sense. And when that ego becomes more purified, we can relax. And we don't take things as personally. It's hard to offend somebody with a you know, nicely purified ego. It's very difficult, if not, if not impossible. And so, but that doesn't mean we become indifferent. And, and it is easy without the compassion piece, without recognizing that essential principle, it is easy to become indifferent and to be in our kind of own little nirvana bubble. But the real good joy asks us to turn, to turn our hearts towards suffering and go right into it and have that courage to pick up Night by Eli Wiesel and read about Auschwitz to turn on 12 Years a Slave and feel slavery or whatever it is but it's it's experiencing the moment and allowing it to connect us to our greater sense of, of purpose and affection towards our fellow brothers, sisters, human beings. So let us, with that uh, mood, begin to move, come into hands and the knees, so must the